I ran into a test problem the other day while working on a side project. I was working with some multi-segment displays that were acting up, and when something goes wrong with my projects, I almost always find that the error is between the keyboard and the chair. So of course, I powered up my scope and went poking around. The problem is though, that the four channels weren't enough to get a full picture of my system. And this happens a lot with embedded designs. There are a lot of peripherals and status lines that need to be checked. Individually, that's easy, but it gets tricky when you want to see all of them at once. And that's where an MSO becomes invaluable, especially if you just want to see the collective status of different systems. So today we're gonna look at some of my favorite tricks for using digital channels. The first is to always get good grounding. As my skydiving instructor slash life coach always says, the more grounding, the better. But grounding every pin isn't always necessary. For low speed signals, the digital channel's equivalent circuit looks like this. That's not too bad, so you can usually get away with grounding every eighth channel or so. Back in the day, that was one ground lead per pod. If you're in an electrically noisy environment though, I recommend grounding every third channel. When you get to high frequency systems with rise times of less than three nanoseconds or so, the equivalent circuit changes from this to this. And our impedance versus frequency looks different too. At this point, you need to start grounding every lead. If your layout reflects your test plan, like all good layouts do, this is actually pretty easy to do. Your digital probes come with some handy accessories, like this male-female adapter that will let you hook up to an array of signals all at once, and these ground leads. If you put in a socket and route your grounds correctly, the whole thing is a breeze. These accessories are super handy for designs where you plan to head and have some grounded header pins. These are nice when you just want to hook up to a nearby ground post, but it is still important to keep your ground leads as short as possible. These IC clips are also pretty handy. Once connected, you can play with your digital channel display. You can turn channels off or on, scale them, and I like to assign them to a bus. This makes it easy to see both individual channel activity and get a hex value for that bus. You can then work out which hex values correspond to which device states. Checking a bus's hex value is much easier than trying to verify each channel individually. You can also use cursors to measure values or trigger on specific channel activity or bus values. If you're using serial protocols, you can also use digital channels to decode them, saving your analog channels for other debugging work. It takes some work up front to set up, but this makes it really easy to go back and validate firmware changes or verify multiple boards. MSO channels are one of those things that I don't really think about until I desperately need it, and I imagine you're in the same boat. Or bus. <laughs> that joke never gets old. Anyways, if you want to learn more about using scopes and other test gear, go check out the Wave resource libraries. There are tons of great tips like that over there in the form of eBooks, white papers, and app notes that we handpicked for you. Today we'll also pick our last 11 prize winners, but since we're live today, it's become tradition to pull out a favorite tip from the vault. One of the prize options for Wave winners is a data acquisition system. We haven't done any DAC tips at all this year, so today we're gonna pull out a video from 2018 that digs into one of the most common DAC use cases, temperature measurements. And today we're gonna take a quick look at how to make temperature measurements with a data acquisition system, also known as a DAC. A DAC system is a general measurement system, and they can measure temperature and some electrical parameters like voltage, current, resistance, capacitance, and more. They may or may not have a built-in source and a built-in DMM to make these measurements easier. If a DAC does have a source, it's generally a low power source for basic measurement requirements. So in many DAC setups, you'll need to complement the system by including DC power supplies, arbitrary waveform generators, or RF and microwave signal generators. These allow you to provide DC biasing or test signals to your device under test. Today though, we're gonna keep it simple and use just the DAC to measure a few thermistors on my temperature cube and see how the fan impacts the system temperature. This is a pretty common test that you might have to run on your devices. We're using a DAC 970A and a DAC M901A multiplexer module. The DAC is wired to the temperature cube and can measure the temperature with its built-in thermistor temperature sensors. We're also using a USB cable to connect the DAC to my laptop and using the Benfew DAC software to control it. We're just using a basic temperature cube, but a setup similar to this gets used all the time in the wild. This type of setup could be used to measure more than just temperature. DACs can measure all kinds of electrical characteristics and are often used to test things like AC to DC power converters, battery packs, medical devices, and radio communication devices. So there are three main steps to making a temperature measurement. 
First, we need to connect and configure our setup. In this case, we're gonna use the DAC M901A modules channels 101, 102, and 103, which are wired to the temperature cubes thermistors T1, T2, and T3. Then we're gonna open up BenchView and make sure we're connected and ready to configure our DAC. With a modern DAC, you can set up, collect, and analyze data in a single piece of software. Now that it's connected, we'll go to step two, setting up our test. In BenchView, I'm gonna set up the temperature channels in an easy spreadsheet format. We're using 10 kilo ohm thermistors, so I'm gonna set each channel to the appropriate setting. Now that we're set up, we can run it. I'm gonna hit start in BenchView, and I'm gonna switch over to my graphics setup so I can watch it running. We can hear my relays clicking, and I'm gonna turn my system on. And we'll be able to see the temperature start to rise as my system runs without any fan. And we're gonna give it a second and turn on the fan and see what happens. Since our graph has gone off screen, I'm gonna go ahead and auto scale in BenchView, and I'm gonna turn on my system's fan. And we should now see the temperature start to drop. And you can see the fans had a pretty big impact on our temperature, so for today's purposes, that is plenty of information for us. Once we've run our tests, we can move to step three, exporting and analyzing data. I'd like to get it in Excel format, but you can also see that BenchView is providing some basic analysis for me. So I wanna do some post-process analysis in Excel, so I'm gonna hit export all, and you can see it gives me a couple file options. We're gonna choose Excel and export here, and it's gonna automatically save that to an Excel file and open that up in the Explorer. And when I go to open this up, you can see it has all of my test information here, and when I scroll down, I have all of my data. I should point out that DACs generally have a memory limit when running tests. This one can store 100K readings into its internal non-volatile memory, meaning you can power cycle it and not lose your readings. But when connected to BenchView, it can use the PC's memory to store up to 1 million readings. So those are the three main steps to making measurements with a DAC. Connect everything together, set up your test procedure, and analyze your data. In this case, we looked at a simple temperature measurement to see what impact our fan had in our system, but like I said, DACs can measure so much more. They can be used to monitor and optimize battery consumption, they can be used to monitor power converters, monitor efficiency of solar power panels, and it can even be used to perform fatigue testing of mechanical components with strain measurement capabilities. And it can perform over voltage and over current measurements with built-in alarm triggers, so you can trigger alerts if something goes wrong.